Hello everyone. Today we are going to study the respiratory system. Uh, we are going to go into the details of physiology and oxygen cascade later. Uh, but first we are going to go into the functional anatomy. So let's get into it. So I am going to start off with the uh, basic dissection of uh, respiratory system. Let's go from top to bottom or from outside to inside. You can see the musculoskeletal system, the intercostal muscles, the big red colored diaphragm. So the intercostal muscles primarily the innermost, the internal and the external. Now the diaphragm is the key muscle that is responsible for the inspiration so when the diaphragm moves downwards to around five to seven centimeters it causes expansion of the chest and is responsible for 75 percent of inspiration whereas the rest of 25 percent is through external intercostal muscle let's go into the detail of intercostal muscles if we dissect the rib cross-sectionally you can see the intercostal groove on the lower aspect of the rib so this is the innermost then the internal intercostal muscle marked in brown and then the external intercostal muscle now the vein artery and nerve in a fixed formation of V A N are placed in the groove this is important from academic point of view as well so you can learn it through the mnemonic of VAN vein artery nerve from inside to outside or from medial to the lateral aspect so note that uh, the chest muscles and chest area is most painful because it is rich in nerves so let's just remove the musculoskeletal system now and go into the lungs so primarily two lungs right lung and the left lung the left lung is smaller than the right lung in terms of bronchopulmonary segments we are going to discuss that later so right lung is responsible for 55 percent of uh, ventilation and it has three lobes whereas the left lung has two lobes and this is why when there is right pneumonectomy chances of post-operative pulmonary complications are more on the right side because it's got more bronchopulmonary segments so more loss of functional lung so the upper respiratory zone of nose throat is primarily responsible for the humidification of gases if the gases are dry of course they would affect the cilia and cause coughing I would mention here the genioglossus muscle because this is responsible for keeping the tongue away from the from falling on the posterior pharynx during breathing so let's come to the trachea the trachea starts with the cricoid and the first tracheal ring is below the cricoid until the carina where the trachea bifurcates into right and left main stem bronchus the trachea itself is 10 to 13 centimeters in adults and it is narrowest at the cricoid level and it is around 1.7 centimeters in male and 1.3 centimeters in female the lumen of the trachea and uh, here I must mention that in children the subglottic area is the narrowest one now I must mention here that the right bronchus is more linear compared to the left bronchus which is more acute as a result of which whenever an object a foreign object is aspirated so chances of it going into the right lower lobes of uh, right lung are more compared to the left lung So let's just go into the understanding of airways and how they branch the dichotomy of the airways into 23 generations from the trachea to the alveolar sac. So by generations I mean trachea divides one generation and then further division of bronchi to two, three, four bronchioles all the way down to 23rd generation where the alveolar sac lies. So if I highlight this area into yellow till the 17th generation 
is the conducting zone by conducting zone I mean the gases are conducted but are not transferred into the blood beyond 17th generation of course the respiratory zone begins and this is marked by respiratory bronchioles so why is conducting zone a conducting zone and respiratory zone a transfer zone this is because of the epithelia the conducting zone has ciliated columnar epithelium and a further transition to cuboidal epithelium so cilia are responsible for collecting all the debris and all the bacteria and then pumping them up into the throat and in the form of cuff um, the secretions and debris are cleared but when we talk about the uh, zones beyond 17th generation namely the respiratory zone this is where the oxygen transfer occurs and why because of the flat epithelium so the epithelia in the lower generations is flat and that is why oxygen exchange takes place in the respiratory zone so let's just rub it all off and let's just revise it again the conducting zone mainly from generation 1 to generation 17 and this is basically primarily composed of ciliated columnar epithelium and the cuboidal epithelium and no oxygen transfer takes place so in other words it is dead space whereas the green area marked is the respiratory zone and when we talked about respiratory zone it is lined primarily by the flat epithelium and flat epithelium is where the oxygen transfer takes place and it is from generation 17 to 23 composed mainly of the respiratory bronchioles the alveolar sacs and the alveoli again you can see from the diagram the conducting zone is still 17 generation now I must mention here that beyond 17 generation there are no cartilage in the airways cartilage keep the airways open so what happens after 17th generation if there is no cartilage then chances of the airway collapse is more in these small airways so the potency of the airways is maintained by the radial attraction of the lungs so what happens after generation 17 let's talk go into the uh, respiratory zones we've uh, discussed already the conducting zone and let's head into the alveolar sacs and the respiratory zone so let's suppose the blue colored is the respiratory bronchiole marked in flat epithelium and branching so one of the, its branches marked in pink it uh, makes alveolar ducts all the way down to the atrium and then the subsequent alveolar sacs we've discussed that 23rd generation is where the alveolar sacs lie so each alveolar sac has around approximately 17 alveoli so let's just dive into the alveolus now each alveolus is supplied by many pulmonary capillaries carrying deoxygenated blood and each pulmonary capillary subsequently supplies many alveoli as well so this is the work of nature uh, as a sort of a safety mirror oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange occurs and the oxygenated blood is then transported into the pulmonary veins there are around 300 to 500 million alveoli and the capillaries cover the net surface area around the alveoli to about 50 to 100 meters square that is the size of a football field so this is work of nature that in such a small lung uh, such a large surface area can be accomplished now in order to understand the logics behind this exchange the epithelium of alveolus and the endothelium of the capillary needs to be understood so let's draw an alveolus and let's just line it with the blue colored epithelium so this epithelium is primarily of two kinds it's called pneumocytes and there is type 1 pneumocytes and type 2 pneumocytes 
type 1 pneumocytes are flat they make tight junctions and they occupy more than 90 percent of the space of the alveolus however they are smaller in number but they occupy greater space type 2 are primarily responsible for production of surfactant and every time type 1 alveoli are destroyed say in ARDS so type 2 can convert into type 1 as for the pulmonary capillary lining these alveolus so each pulmonary capillary has a net diameter of around 10 micrometers which is barely enough for RCC to transport a single RCC to transport through the lumen of the pulmonary capillary it has to be kept in mind that the pulmonary circulation is highly compliant and low resistant uh, circuit so it is mainly dependent on the size of alveolus and the gravitational forces so on the upper side of the lungs the flow is slow because the alveoli are bigger whereas the, on the lower side the alveoli are more compliant smaller in size and they do not stretch so the resistance is low and flow is high there is a thin side that is 0.4 micrometers and there is a thick side which is around 1 to 2 micrometers now the thick side forms the basic structure of the septa whereas the thin side is where the exchange takes place in the alveoli we've already mentioned it is around 10 micrometers uh, the diameter of the pulmonary capillaries barely enough for rbc to move on and this is how uh, quintessentially nature has uh, dictated the oxygen exchange that every single rbc uh, is focused so the junction the endothelial junction of these pulmonary capillaries has big gaps around 5 nanometers as a result of which albumin macrophages neutrophils they easily migrate to the basement membrane and onwards into the lymphatics so the gap junctions in the lungs are 5 nanometers as a result of which the protein rich fluid is easily migrated along with macrophages into the basement membrane the macrophages go into the alveoli and they clear the debris and bacteria again another work of nature a brief uh, focus on the blood flow the bronchial arteries are primarily responsible for carrying and handling the metabolic demand of the lungs it carries less than 4% of cardiac output the pulmonary artery arising from the right ventricle carries deoxygenated blood and it carries almost the whole of cardiac output whereas the pulmonary veins carry oxygenated blood into the left atrium and primarily four in number note that the cardiac output on the pulmonary arteries is same as in the systemic but the pressures are low because it is highly compliant system and resistance is low and this is because lungs are the only organ where in response to hypoxia pulmonary vasoconstriction occurs in the rest of the body vasodilation occurs but in the lungs vasoconstriction to hypoxia and vasodilation to oxygen and this is why when a baby is born and he cries his first breath oxygen going inside the lungs causes vasodilation and reduced resistance as for the lymphatics around 20 ml per hour uh, and protein rich lymph fluid is extracted this is as previously detailed because of the gap junctions in the endothelium of the pulmonary capillaries and as a result of which albumin and other proteins are easily migrated into the basement membrane the innovations of lungs of course the intercostal muscles are supplied by their respective intercostal nerves so it is a very rich uh, area of nerves the sympathetics from t1 to t4 and uh, they stimulate the beta 2 mainly causing bronchodilation and decreased secretions as for the parasympathetics it is carried through vagus nerve and it is through muscarinic receptors causing bronchoconstriction and increased secretions so this is the main innovation but a point to remember here a mnemonic is c345 keeps the diaphragm alive now this is essential because any lesion at C5 level can impair the diaphragm in anesthesia practices when regional blocks are given in supraclavicular area the phrenic nerve is usually blocked but it doesn't cause any major shift because of unilateral block uh, 
If of course bilaterally the phenic nerve is affected then the patient would require mechanical ventilation because diaphragm is the key uh, muscle of inspiration. So one has to be vigilant with the lesions around C5 area. So this is brief detail of functional anatomy of respiratory system. We are going to dive into more detail of physiologies, the lung mechanics and the oxygen exchange. So stay tuned.